Thank you very much. Um, I'm grateful to be here at JupyterCon, really looking forward to the conference. I'd like to talk about some themes that we have been tracking about Jupiter. Uh, we've been tracking this through O'Reilly Media. A lot of this is with respect to uh, enterprise use cases that we're investigating, and much of it will be represented in the business summit uh, throughout today and tomorrow. Uh, so three themes. One is that we've seen large organizations adopting Jupiter uh, for shared analytics infrastructure. Now, there's a kind of leapfrog effect that's involved here that we're seeing, uh, because typically these types of enterprise organizations would have been using commercial offerings for analytics infrastructure. Instead, they've been adopting Jupyter at scale, open source, and uh, ultimately there's, there's a kind of staffing priority, I think, that drives some of this. On the one hand, you've, in a large organization, you've got a lot of people who are well-trained in the problem. Uh, they may not have a lot of the technical background, but they have the domain expertise. And what we're finding is that they can leverage Jupyter to gain enough of the tech, enough of the tooling to really amplify what they're doing in the domain. Uh, this is often referred to as citizen data science, and we're going to see a lot of examples of that. The other thing is about new hires, fresh out. So people are coming out of universities now with a lot of hands-on with Jupyter because of coursework, and then they can go into the workplace and apply that and build, say, machine learning apps on day one that have ROI. So in business, as a manager, why on earth would you derail them and retrain them to use some commercial framework that doesn't quite have that ROI? So issues like this we'll be exploring from the people who are making these changes happen at the Business Summit. Number two, over the past couple of decades, we've had this operating assumption in software engineering that process is something very general at a very high layer, and it's applicable to a wide range of applications. And then, well, Agile, of course, is, is the example there. And then there's, there's software, which is still relatively general. There's layers of abstraction. And then there's hardware. It's much more specific. It's really down there. Hardly anybody needs to really touch the hardware directly. The software abstracts it away. And besides, it doesn't really change much. It just gets faster year over year. Well, that all inverted. And so if you haven't gotten the memo about this, some of the best people in software engineering are grappling now with what we see as sort of a, a temporal regime of chaos. We're not exactly sure where this is going, but we know that hardware is moving faster than software. Software is moving faster than process. Jupyter is being used as a way for teams to future-proof because teams can articulate units of work in Jupyter or, or workflow in, in Jupyter and yet still have efficient access to customized hardware. Uh, this fits especially well with cloud services. We see this a lot in cases of, say, deep learning and GPUs, uh, and the cloud providers are picking that up. I like to show resources from O'Reilly, so uh, everyone here, of course, gets the complimentary 90-day uh, subscription to Safari. Another resource is called the O'Reilly Data Show, hosted by my colleague Ben Lorica. And here's a, a recent interview with Andrew Feldman from Cerebus talking about this kind of proliferation of customized hardware. Uh, you know, we're seeing multi-core GPUs, TPUs, IPUs, DWPUs, FPGAs, and a wide range of ASICs being used now for machine learning, for edge computing, for decentralization. That whole landscape has shifted, shifted and it's changing software engineering. All right, number three. Uh, as large organizations adopt Jupyter, one of the first things that emerges, one of the first things the organizations run into are the organizational challenges. Uh, privacy, uh, ethics, security, compliance. These are the kind of things that we want to have in the dialogue now. And these are also things that Silicon Valley didn't pay enough attention to until recently. So Jupiter helps to address a lot of these needs. We'll be exploring that again in the Business Summit. A lot of what's happening, what's really interesting, is when within the highly regulated environments, uh, finance, defense, healthcare, again, where you want to have that kind of critical dialogue going on. That's also where there's a lot of rapid evolution of open source, and that part was unexpected. Uh, speaking of which, as far as resources, O'Reilly has a, a free mini book you can download. Ben Lorica and I did uh, a study about AI adoption in enterprise worldwide, and uh, we received over 8,000 respondents. Uh, there's some very surprising insights that came out of it in aggregate. Uh, number one, the, the sophistication of uh, 
provisions for privacy and ethics in the machine learning workflows. It's a lot more advanced than we had imagined it was out in the field. And number two, also software engineering process is changing. It's not business as usual. It's not going to be uh, agile for AI, for instance. It's going to be something else. OK, an even larger challenge looms. We're three decades past when Tim Berners-Lee introduced World Wide Web, more than five decades since Ted Nelson introduced hypertext, more than seven decades since Vannevar Bush and Borges had first articulated about hypertext. Uh, online media has had this expanse. At the same time, print media has all but collapsed. And unfortunately, science in many ways, because of publish or perish, science has been coupled tightly with print media. So there have been a couple of interesting articles over the past year that talked about, uh, actually, Jupiter in a very favorable light, but criticisms of science and the publisher perish thing as a scattered library of digital paper, all neatly indexed by keyword search and Wikipedia entries, except when they're not. Uh, if you haven't seen this yet, I highly recommend. It's an article from a couple weeks ago in Wired magazine. It's about a company called Primer, and they have a new uh, kind of AI software called uh, Quicksilver. This is a project led by uh, the infamous scientist journalist John Bohannon, a good friend, and also Amy Heineke, Sean Gourlay, and a lot of the folks at Primer. What uh, Quicksilver has done is to detect, identify, and correct gender imbalance in Wikipedia, uh, doing natural language understanding, natural language generation. Uh, very advanced, and it does show a lot of bias uh, underrepresentation of women in science in uh, digital paper. Um, okay, so the pioneers of online media, they had dreamt of new ways for us to expand our shared understanding, science, etc. They had not dreamt, however, about trolling or Russian bots or hospital ransomware or climate science under attack because of allegations of non-reproducible science. Um, we're here talking about open source. Those things are exploits against a broader context, open society. Now, Karl Popper is very interesting. He was contemporary with Vannevar Bush, and he warned about precisely that. He warned about the urgency of reproducibility in science and the linkage from that into social discourse and the linkage into governance, that if they aren't handled properly, they lead very quickly to totalitarianism. We were knowing this, seeing this at the end of World War II. If you haven't read that second book there, I highly recommend The Open Society and Its Enemies. Uh, if, you, if you haven't read it, stop what you're doing. Go find a copy, read it, reread it, grab a bunch of your friends, talk about it in detail. I believe that in 2018, there are surprisingly few other things that are as salient as this, other than climatology. Um, and also, as far as resources on uh, O'Reilly and astrophysics, here's a great one from Steve Kramer, uh, the mathematics of studying how galaxies collide, being applied to study cyber threat in social media. Uh, for instance, Russian bots on Twitter there. Alrighty, uh, eight decades after World War II, we have inherited now a blend of the optimism from Vannevar Bush about hypertext and the cautionary tales from Karl Popper about reproducibility. And it has to do with how unmitigated power craves universal statements. Now, this is really important in scientific research. It's also important in other fields that are vital for open society data science, et cetera, software engineering, teaching, journalism. We'll be covering a lot of this at the conference here. Uh, our question is, what else? I, I want to thank a friend, Tony Fast, is out here. He'll be speaking at the conference later. He introduced me to the notion that reproducible science and open source really have a lot to learn from each other. And much of what we're doing here at JupyterCon is to bring these different disciplines together under one roof and then discover what is it that they must learn from each other. So with that, uh, I really look forward to the rest of the conference. I want to meet a lot of people. I wish you all the best. Thank you.